I want to bring in former director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management, Joe Myers. He was responsible for the state's emergency response plan after Hurricane Andrew. Also with us, former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate. Together, they designed and implemented Florida's emergency management system, which is the foundation that is in use today. Good to talk to both of you. You're both veterans of dealing with natural disasters. Craig, you and I have spoken many times, but rarely in a situation like this, is it possible, even with all the work that's been done, to be ready for a storm of this magnitude? Well, I think everything that can be done is being done. But the part of this we're not talking about yet is the immediate response after the storm. And this is where we've seen time and time again, we talk about first responders, but the thing that's gonna really save lives are neighbors checking on neighbors. This is over such a large area that the fastest response is gonna be the public helping each other while the responders are trying to get back in these communities. You know, Joe, Governor Ron DeSantis says this is the largest mobilization of the National Guard in advance of a storm in state history. But are people who are on the ground on the front lines, whether they've evacuated somewhere, whether they're in a shelter, or whether they're among the handful of people who have decided to stay behind? Yeah, yes, that, that's correct. Uh, the National Guard was, is there to help them through, uh, throughout this event. Uh, I think there's like 6,000 guards from Florida and another 3,000 that were brought into the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, which uh, we, Craig and I, was part of our uh, building the plan in the beginning, as a lesson learned from Andrew, where we could bring in resources from other states. And uh, they'll be supporting people in shelters and helping get people out of the area and providing a lot of valuable transportation. My colleague, Matt Levitas, Joe, talked to a couple in a mobile home community in St. Petersburg. They say they're just not leaving. None of the assistance that we've applied for has even came in. So it's, it's, it's left, a, it's left us uh, you picking and pulling straws here. You know, um, is it uh, stay with your ship and sink with it or go abandon ship and go somewhere else that might be worse? Right. You know, it, it's 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 a bit, it's one of them two headed coins. Scary either way. I don't know if you could hear the end of that, Joe. She said it's scary either way. And now we're seeing tornadoes picking up. Is there anything that you would want to say to folks like that right now? I would hope that they would can have time to get out because uh, this is a this storm is we haven't seen anything quite like this. And the storm surge is going to be awful. Um, and I know just two weeks ago when I was sitting here in Tallahassee and thinking about a cat four coming down, I mean, it just, you know, you have, it causes a lot of anxiety and things, but I would hope these people and others would take heed and get, and get out of the area. You know, Craig, the New York Times uh, was looking at the big picture, uh, and in a story, they say these extreme hurricanes that we're seeing now are just the beginning, and I want to quote from that article. We are witnessing a new reality. Supercharged hurricanes are no longer outliers, freak disasters, or storms of the century. Fossil fuel pollution has made them a fixture of life around the world, and they are going to get worse, with millions of people in their crosshairs. Many Americans refuse to believe that a major hurricane could hit them. Is that indeed the new normal, and are we ready for it, Craig? Well, it is, and, it's, and we're not. Uh, climate change is a deed. It's already changed, and we're not going back quickly. And we really got to talk about adaptation. If you think about the standards we use to build our infrastructure, it was based upon the past. You know, with these record setting events occurring almost weekly across the globe, our infrastructure wasn't built for it. And so when these storms hit, we need to make sure when we rebuild, we're not just building it back the way it was. We really need to build it for the future risk our communities face. So is what you're saying, technology has come a long way, but we either don't have the will or the money to, to make it better? What has to happen? We're going to have to get used to this idea that um, a lot of times we hear pushback when local officials try to improve building codes, that it's going to make homes unaffordable and we need to develop to grow our economy. But we can't do that irresponsibly. We have to build for the risk. And that means we got to change how we're building and where we're building. Uh, we're already seeing the insurance industry 
is no longer able to ensure many of these weather-related risks. So we cannot continue doing what we've always done and just eat by through these storms. We're going to have to fundamentally rethink how and what we build and our response systems. And the fact that more and more of this loss is being shifted to the federal taxpayer away from private insurance. So we have to change because the environment's changed and our systems and infrastructure are not keeping up. And we haven't even talked about the fact of how many people can't get or can't afford insurance. That is a conversation we will have on another day. Craig Fugate, Joe Myers, thank you both.